Hi, I'm Gary David. And I'm Adam Gamwell. Welcome to Experience by Design, the podcast where we explore experience designs of all kinds. Anyone, and I mean anyone who is in education, knows the challenge that exists when we're trying to deliver content that can connect with students. And I was just reliving those moments this past semester of trying to connect my content with students, and they seemingly not caring about it. Not not a great memory. Very traumatic. Mm -hmm. It, and I do have to remember, and it can be hard to remember, that the material that exists might not be that exciting for students, even though it is really exciting for those who are teaching. After all, we go into this teaching these topics because we get excited by it. And although I do find it terribly hard to imagine that sociological theory isn't fascinating for everyone, I do have to remember that not everyone cares about the things I care about. Weird. I know, right? Like, who wouldn't care about, you know, Max Weber and Emil Durkheim and yeah. Frederick Toynes? I mean, it's just, it's just befuddling to me, but nevertheless, there it is. But at the same time, I do have to remember that there's plenty of academic material and scholarly material that I can find completely indecipherable. Still haven't completely read Foucault. I admitted it. That's fair. That's fair. Neither have I. I mean, I, I tried reading it. I was like, I can't, can't do this. It's too hard. And so keeping that in mind, when you read this material, you know, you can start to see how confusing, lengthy, and perhaps even boring it can be. After all, academics write for their academics. And when dealing with students who are not academic, the question becomes, how do you get them excited, interested, and engaged with that material? The answer, it turns out, is in many ways pretty simple. As with any population, in order to communicate, you have to speak their language. Or if not be fluent in their language, you at least have to communicate in ways that they can understand. In other words, from a design approach, we have to be learner-centric when creating educational content. Mm. So true. And, you know, such a, a theme that has, has been part of our conversations for years. And so we're really excited that today's guests on Experience by Design have a strategy that just might help in this area. And in a, I think, quite unique way. So Emily Ritter knows the challenge also of connecting with students as a PhD in political science that explores some challenging issues like human rights, domestic conflicts, and international relations. Her work is super relevant to major issues of our time. But even these important issues and ideas can get lost on students who can't wade through the textbooks and journal articles. And I mean, hell, as a as a former graduate student and uh, you know teacher, I also can have have problems going through these textbooks and journal articles, kind of as you, as you said, Gary. They're horrible. Yeah. You know, and imagine this is compounded when we're trying to share some complex ideas with policymakers in the broader public too, who are not, you know, in a classroom on purpose. So to solve this problem, Emily and her graphic artist husband, Derek, combined their superpowers and started an organization called Sequential Potential, which is a great name. Great and this name. is a company that takes educational content and repurposes it, turns it in, remorphs it into comic books and graphic novels. You heard that right, folks. The, uh, you know, Max Weber is getting the Captain America treatment. Absolutely. You know, and the, the results are, are honestly, they're stunning depictions, right? They're portrayals of academic concepts and content in ways that is uh, made to be accessible to readers of all ages and folks coming from all different walks of life. And for our conversation today, Emily is joined by doctoral candidate in history, Travis Hill, he is a comic book creator and one of the sequential potential artists. And together, we're going to be exploring the challenge of creating academic content that connects with audiences, especially through a visual medium like comics and graphic novels. And the mission of this organization is to help people of you know of all stripes understand the processes and evidence of rigorous research and connect those findings with their own lives. So this is, I think, one of the key pieces that we'll be diving into is not only making the research interesting to think about and, and engage with, but then also making uh, the power of rigorous research something that's also accessible and exciting to people. So it's a really, really interesting way uh, to bring this to life. And Sequential Potential shows us this really important way of doing it. So super fascinating conversation and frankly inspirational uh, as, as also a, a fellow comic book nerd. Um, this is exciting for us to bring to you about how we can take academic material 
bring it to the mainstream throughout the universal language of comics. Can't wait to share it with you. So we'll dive in right after this. And I think, you know, the first thing that I find amazing about what you all do is you try to make uh, professors sound relatable and interesting, which I don't know how you thing to do, right? It's a very hard thing to to do. (laughs) I don't know how you do that because I mean, having been a professor and having been around a fair number of them in my life, it seems, you know, pretty near impossible to actually take academic ease and render it in a way that's more widely accessible to audiences of different uh, levels of understanding about these topics. Yeah. And sometimes we even put the professor in the comic themselves, which makes Mm. them seem even more relatable. Or maybe not, right? Maybe it's best that when we take them out, we think we could tell the best story when it's not the professor that's telling the story, and instead, it's a more organic story. So all professors want to want to seem cartoonish. So I think right? that that's uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah, but I think, whether uh, they want to seem that way, they are that way. <laughs> so it's just nice to use them in that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that um, just I, I'm I'm a PhD student, and then just continued learning and. And and enjoying these subject matters that are brought to us that I don't know anything about. Like I don't know. Any, I'm I'm a PhD in history. I don't think you know. I don't know anything about neurobiology, but um, but getting to learn something about that and new developments in that field and create a comic about it. I'm like, this is exciting. And so for me, it's about getting to learn something new. And then I'm not an expert in that field, so pulling out what I think is valuable for you know, somebody at my level to, to engage with. I think that's um, a lot of fun in the process and, and how we can get to that relatability, being the, the middle person. Yeah, a mm-hmm. few points there, Travis. Number one, very good for diminishing your knowledge in the midst of three PhDs. It's a very smart move. <laughs> That'll serve you well in your <laughs> academic career. And number two, this must be very triggering for you. It must seem almost like a defense meeting or a committee meeting right now. They have three PhDs <laughs> and a PhD student at the same time. I'm preparing for it. That's right. it. Yeah. <laughs> and his will be in history. So we've got a, a nice representation of the social sciences here. <laughs> that's a good point actually yes that's that's this is oddly perfect <laughs> <laughs> it's like a humanities social science meeting all at once on experience by design podcast <laughs> i mean one, one thing I'm, I'm curious about in terms of like also level setting for for the audience to think about um what sequential potential do and in, in, in does in the kind of work that you do that um when I was, I was kind of reading about the work and looking at some of the the pieces that y'all have produced um, I was reminded in, in graduate school, when I was in graduate school, some years ago doing my master's, I did a class in visual anthropology and, and did some research and papers on, on comics. And of course, remember like Frederick Wertheim, the psychiatrist in the fifties that like wrote this, uh, treatise against comic books saying it was going to like make adolescent boys into delinquents and make them confused and run them up. <laughs> I don't know if, you, if y'all see it's, it's just crazy. He, he almost took down the comic book industry in the fifties. Yeah. Uh, as this, this, Sounds uh, you like know, TV, jazz, you know, blues, yep. no, pick your thing, right? <laughs> drugs, booze. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We're ruining you know? America's youth. Exactly. Right. You know, so, so this, this idea, I mean, it, it kind of popped back in my head and made me chuckle, but then also just remembering to this, this idea of like, when we ever, whenever we're in this case, like bringing a different kind of medium into conversation with other forms of media, like academic monographs, research, bringing in um, illustration, comic, and, and kind of sequential art. I'm curious about what inspired you to do this. Like, this is, a, I think it's really cool. And it's great even talking with with both you, Emily, and Travis, coming from different areas of study also, you know, in terms of what you're, you're both doing, mm-hmm. um, but then bring in the kind of artistic element to that. So what what got you into making comics uh, into this, this new kind of realm and into academic research and, and scholarship? So my husband is uh, a trained artist. He has a, an MFA in painting and he's been making comics for a long time and been really into the comic medium. But in particular, he didn't grow up reading comics. He came to it late through investigating um, and experiencing graphic novels, right? And graphic novels have, have this advantage um, of allowing you to feel what the characters are experiencing when what they experience is every day 
right? So when you're reading superhero comics, like you don't see yourself in the, the, the tights of Superman. You see yourself when you're reading something like Blankets or Mouse and they're around real, uh, uh, you know, real people and, um, and their experiences in their lives. And so he came to it from that perspective and has always mm. really enjoyed autobiographical comics and graphic novels. Um, mm. At the same time, I'm a political scientist. Um, and in particular, I study um, how states repress populations and how mm. that interacts with protest actions. So um, I'm studying inequalities. I'm studying violence against civilians. I'm studying protest actions and social movements. And mm. in my field, when we talk about creating impacts from the research that we're doing, we're often talking about um, speaking to policymakers and how do we convince government actors to respond to the research that we have. But my research is political, but it's about everyday people. It's about people who want to protest. And I have insights about uh, people who are having their rights violated and are being repressed. And in no way am I being taught how to convey those ideas to mm -hmm. the people that are most affected by them, right? And mm -hmm. so um, Derek and I, you know, talk all the time because we're married and we- uh, well, That's good. Just came to this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an ideal, it's an well ideal form of marriage when you keep talking to each other and, <laughs> right. uh, and tell each other your problems. And he's like, God, I can't figure out how to make comics that people want to read. And I'm like, God, I wish I could talk to people, like real people mm. about the work that I do. And then, you know, there was a magic moment and the music was playing and we came up with this idea. And so um, ever since then, we've been, he's been working with a lot of political scientists, but a lot of um, different kinds of scholars to be able to do this, to connect the things that we know with people's lived experiences and uh, in so doing, educate them about what we know about the world. And so we've done that for academics and we've done it for nonprofit organizations and we've done it for a variety of, of different kinds of clients. So that's really fantastic because it made me think as, you, as you're saying that too, where even if, if folks aren't familiar with, I'm, I'm, I'm a self-avowed comic nerd um, um, <laughs> as part of this too, but just like if, you know, again, like if folks don't, don't typically read them, right. I think you, you made an important distinction there early on too, that like there's a graphic novel versus a comic book series. And like those can be these, these, they can be over-related, but typically, right. Like a graphic novel would be a longer form um, sequential comic, right? And so, yeah, yeah I think it, I thought of Persepolis too, and you were talking about people's lived experiences and kind of memoirs and autobiography pieces. And Mouse is a great example too. And so, I think that that's a really, I mean, I, I think it's super compelling, right? That how do we yeah. bring those stories elsewise? And this other kind of piece that makes me think of too um, is science communication, right? And like, how do scholars translate a lot of academic research and the thing, like the way you said it, things that we know into people's real lived experiences. Um, in ways that can get people to take action. So I think that that's, uh, to me, I think it's it's a really, really cool idea. And it's, uh, to me, also just encouraging to hear that there's been so much uptake across different fields, whether it's nonprofits, you know, organizational institutions, um, uh, higher education, places like that. So that that's really cool to see too. Um, so I'm going to yeah, stop. Yeah, and I, I, I really like thinking about that. That's okay. <laughs> I really like thinking about that call to action element of it, right? Like if we mm. as scholars are trying to, convey that our work has impact on the world, then people need to be able to see how it impacts them and then know what to do about it. And comics are a complete story and they allow us to do both of those things all the while people are looking at beautiful images and uh, really engaging in, in different ways. <laughs> and, and like you said, it, you don't have to be a comic nerd, right? You don't have to have... Mm. Um, waited for the next issue of X, Y, and Z to come out when you were a kid to enjoy this because you probably were assigned Watchmen when you were in college or you mm -hmm. probably had to read Mouse when you were in high school or you probably had uh, a number of books that are actually comics on your shelf that you didn't even realize, like you don't think of them as comics because they're so serious, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. Well, and that right there is part of kind of these meetings that I have with different academics. Um, it, would it, they all love comics and have some on their shelves. The other day I was in this meeting with a, a research team from a public health school and they are wanting to do a, a couple of pages of comics to get messaging out about this program they have. And 
they were asking me a bunch of questions. There were like nine professors in this in this meeting. And they said, somebody asked, well, who's who are these going to be for? And then somebody else in the group said, well, I guess it's the younger part of the group that we're trying to reach because that's who reads comics. And then I just said, so you don't think the older people mm-hmm. in this group read comics? And, and a lot of these professors were you know, older than me. And easy, careful there. Don't say that to your committee. I'm 37. <laughs> don't I'm, I'm leave not, that I'm off. Not young anymore. I'm not too young. <laughs> but but then they started saying, Well, yeah, I read comics. And and by the end of the conversation, all nine of the professors on this call were pulling comics off their shelves about comics <laughs> they read. And I said, Yeah, everybody, everybody reads them. And 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 if we all just have a conversation about it, that's the preferred reading sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. One of my fields, one of my fields is comic book studies um, and the history of, of comics. And on my reading list, I read the graphic novels first <laughs> before I got mm-hmm. into some of the other uh, monographs. So it's just the reality. I, I don't like comics. Um, I've desperately wanted to be a comic person. I've tried. I mm-hmm. I, I go to some place like, um, uh, you know, what, what's the place, Adam, that, um, you know, the comic book store in the Boston area? Um, the, 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 the big chain. Closed? The big chain. One. I can't remember the name of that one. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I got a magic dragon down the road from I'm, my I'm blanking on it. And it's it's because <laughs> as Travis said, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but you know, I've, I've really wanted to become a comic book person. It seems fun. I've wanted to care about that kind of thing. Um, but I, I just could not get into it. Newberry comics. So Newberry comics is a store Newberry that's place. around Boston yeah. and malls. And I've gone in with my daughters. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then I'm like, oh man, this seems like a lot of work to get into. I don't know if I have the time. And so, so on the one hand, I'm thinking that way, but on the other hand, how many times do professors ask students? So how many of you are academic literature people? <laughs> right. How many of by you choice, by choice, by choice, <laughs> we, we never, when we assign readings to people, we yeah. never ask them if they are into that genre of, mm-hmm. of material. We never ask. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that comic books evokes this kind of reaction of, well, are are they comic book people, quote unquote, or not, when we mm-hmm. don't think about that question in relation. So it also makes me think about the presumptions about who are comic book people and that one needs to be a particular kind of person in order to appreciate the content that's presented therein. And I think that that's, that's super insightful, that we're not like that we think of comics as only being appealing to a certain kind of group. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that ignores how much we see comics every day, right? They're in the New Yorker. They're accompanying news stories. They are um, inserted as, uh, you know, there are political cartoons. There are all of these micro ways that comics are in our lives that we don't, you know, they don't, we don't, throw away the New Yorker because there's comics in it, right? Like, and in fact, those are one of the things that we enjoy about the most. And so I think that there are so many ways in which you don't have to be an active person to, to um, in seeking out and benefiting from comics because they're just, they're in our lives. Well, the, 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 the staying power of comics is evidenced by the fact that the family circus still get published. I mean, I don't oh know anybody who, who, who likes that. <laughs> You know, and now, I, now I'm, I'm being old because I'm like looking at blank like family circuits. What's that? See, kids, oh, no, back I when I was is. growing I'm just up, that it's still being published. We used to get Sunday comics <laughs> yeah. in the newspaper, and we used to actually read them, right? And this was mm-hmm. a form of entertainment before we had cell phones and things like that. So, you know, to your point, Sunday had the color print too. Yeah, had the color print. Right. Fancy. That, that was it. You know, and so that you know, the idea of it makes me think of a few things. Number one, the single panel comic versus the multiple panel comics but also i know your model is taking producing a comic for a particular topic but what about almost like an academic um smorgasbord comic where it's like the sunday comics where there's you know like a history comic or an anthropology comic or a political science comic or mm-hmm. sociology comic that people are leafing through as almost a series i mean because it creates Wouldn't a lot it of possibility potential 
wouldn't it be great for like a peer reviewed journal to have a bunch of comic abstracts, right? Like oh, one of so our most good. common products so yeah, it's that we put a single, we create a single page that kind of just gives you the bare bones of a study, just like a, a 150 word abstract would. And if you got a peer reviewed journal that had a bunch of those in there, how freaking cool would that be? I have a theory that I'm kind of curious about Adam and Emily and even Travis. Sometimes I think as academics, we're afraid of making our material too accessible because it'll make us feel less special. Hmm. You I know? think that's I fair. And I, I, we also like have a credibility know. issue, right? Like we as social scientists or as professors or academics, like when you read um, articles by microbiologists, their titles are like, totally incomprehensible to me. But there's a credibility mm. signaling, I think, that people want to use jargon and they want to, you know, be very technical in the arguments that they make. And we need that too, right? You actually do need a peer-reviewed version of your research and uh, supported with the evidence and your credibility and so forth. But that doesn't mean you can't also take the same thing and make it accessible. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it doesn't undermine your credibility to be able to, ex to speak with expertise in a different genre. Yeah. yeah. I, it, it, I, I'm not in that same space. Uh, my, my PhD committee approved uh, my dissertation to be a graphic novel. So I don't. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you're in Texas. So I mean, it's like barely even a. <laughs> That's okay. Adam's from Texas. So I, I have to I'm from it. Texas also. This I have to make he, a Texas, really Texas. Episode, yeah. <laughs> There you go. I see how it is. That's pretty yeah. amazing though, Travis, that you get to be a graphic design novel for your district. Yeah, that's amazing. How, how did you how did you get them to agree upon that? Or was it not difficult? Um, so well well, so one of my professors, I had I had kind of one of my fields is civil rights history, and and I had kind of mentioned to her that I would like to do this. And then she was at the Dallas the big Dallas comic con where I had a table and I was selling some of my uh, books and she came up and brought some new academic like history books that she had like history graphic novels she had seen. And she said, if you put together a comic, like a graphic novel like this, I mean, she's over here at my table, like talking to me about school. And I'm like, all right, that's good. <laughs> Which was awesome. And uh, she's like, well, we can, if, if it's like this, then I'll, I would approve that. And I said, okay, great. And then, um, <clears throat> Um, my, uh, Matthew Brown, he, for my exam field in comic studies, he, he said, you need to write a paper for your exam to, that explains why, um, comics, like why a graphic novel is, is like a good form for academic history. And so I'm finishing up that paper. And he said, once you have that, then you'll be fine. Like you don't have to worry about it. So I had to give a defense and then, um, and then I, um, I'm in the clear. So nice. took a little convincing for, a, for a couple of them, but one, she was just on board. I, I thought that was great. Now I just have to figure out. Yeah. Well, that's the case. You got the form. You got you to gotta put the words in there now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's all here. She's got to um, put it on the, on the computer. You know, that, that's the thing. I just linked to a, a book called uh, Unflattening, which was this person's dissertation and has all of its scholarly references in it and so forth. But it's also exploring um, how words relate to images and does so in the comic form, right? So Tom, mm. I, as much as Travis is innovating in this particular field, he's also not the first person who's written their dissertation no. as a graphic novel. No, yeah, Nick, Nick Susanis, and I've you know gotten to <clears throat> become you know friends with him through reading his book, I wrote a review for it. Um, and, and he does make the argument in there, like kind of, you know, comics, the graphic novel form is one of the highest forms of like written communication that human beings have access to. And I said, okay, I'll buy into that. I'll buy into that. I don't know if everybody will, but I will. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it makes sense. You know, um, I, I mean, even, I was actually just thinking of that exact, I'm um, flattening as the, the, the exact example too, um, as you're posting that, Emily, because I think it's it's a really interesting point to show that like we we can and we do see evolution in terms of like what counts as quote unquote academic literature, right? In terms of peer reviewed and, and credibility. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also we're, like, we need to do this kind of thing. We have to kind of push the envelope in, in that space too. And, you know, I've, I've seen 
one or two podcast document uh, kind of dissertation versions where it's like, you know, it's obviously different, different to a site when you're talking <laughs> as, right. as quoted by, you know, author X 25, you know, in the journal of whatever, um, Open but you know, but they can also be in the transcript. Date, page yeah. number, <laughs> close parentheses. <laughs> right. It's a very long, very long podcast just because of that. Right. You know, uh, but these, these ideas, I think it's interesting that we do see these kinds of kinds of emergencies um, on the, on the one side of, can I use these as the the mechanism by which I get the credentials for the degree? The other side too, and and I'm curious about this from your your work, Travis, is is that uh, you know you recently posted about that you've done some work on the illusion of accountability, where you're you're helping creating kind of an abstract for some authors that have created a work, right? And so there's also this this side I think that is interesting to kind of add to the conversation too, uh, in terms of you know if if scholars have something published and they want to make it differently accessible. Um, so I'd, I'd be curious to hear about that example or, or any other kind of example like this, where you, you're taking somebody else's work and then helping create storyboard scripting in art around it to then help tell that story to, to different audiences. Um, the, that's interesting too, where it's like starting from scratch to research into, a, into production, or it is taking an existing work and then adapting it. Um, do you like, what are the differences between those two, those two forms of, of creation? Um, yeah. So starting, taking someone else's work and adapting it is, is harder for me, not in terms of you want to be honest to the work and you want to create characters that are honest to the work as well. Um, you know, if that in the illusion of accountability, the reporter and, um, the, 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 the civilian who are on this journey through time, those aren't real people, but they have to be real in a way that, that can, communicate what um, Harden and Kirkland have said in their book. And, and it takes me a little bit longer to really make sure that is, is kind of where it needs to be. So um, I just finished a a 20 page graphic novella for um, a, a book that, or a comic we're doing about sanctions in Iran. And, um, and so I was trying to create fictional characters, um, that represented all of these real people they had interviewed who had been negatively impacted by sanctions and to show how Iranian society had been impacted as a whole and how it had kind of changed, um, since, you know, Trump imposed those like maximum sanctions. And so that, that's, that was tough. I enjoyed it. It was a challenge that was new to me, but it's like, I need to create fictional representations of all of these people. And I have to be fair to everyone. And whereas, and so then I have to like really navigate that dialogue, honestly, and and keep going back to the source and then doing a lot. I mean, good bringing in my kind of history work. I, I know how to go and find other sources. So, so some of it, a lot of it was me doing my own research on the location on, on, um, on uh, just, just kind of the history of the last five years in Iran. And I was, you know, pulling articles for myself. And so, mm-hmm. um, so a lot of that work, whereas, you know, I have a, I have a book series called techno nights with dauntless stories. And it's kind of, it's a super sentai power rangers thing. It's just me writing jokes, and <laughs> having guys, <laughs> having characters beat up bad guys and, you know, you know, go through yeah. some, some emotional character development, but, that is not as painstakingly in, in the weeds of, of really trying to make sure you're honest to somebody's source material, honest to people's lives. Um, so that's it. That's kind of the difference where it, I have fun with both, but one is just me kind of free form, you know, the techno night story is just me. And I, I based all the characters off me and my three brothers. And it's just me writing jokes about me and my brothers and that's it. <laughs> and so that's a little bit easier, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of the difference between the two. Um, Your story about taking the Iranian sanctions and then turning it in, taking those characters and turning the fictionalized characters reminds me exactly of like the grapes of wrath. When I talk to people, mm-hmm. when I teach ethnography, I say Grapes of Wrath is one of my favorite ethnographies because Steinbeck was a journalist who was interviewing people from Oklahoma who were working in California and he was publishing these stories for a newspaper and then Tom Jode and the other characters were fictional representations of the people that he interviewed along with some fictional license, right? And so it's 
you know, there is this question of, and even some question, even eth ethnographic writing, if our goal is to make it memorable and engage people in a topic so that they're conscious of these issues, how closely do we really need to be next to our data? It's not, uh, I'm not publishing it for peer review. I'm trying to get people to understand a concept. Mm -hmm. And I think as academics, there's really good reason to be true to the data, clearly, obviously. You don't want to make things up. But at the same time, taking editorial license to make a point for a broader impact is also permissible. And I've seen some ethnographers, you know, create fictionalized accounts, and now Adam has too, based on their research and experiences but aren't necessarily, quote unquote, from the data. They're inspired by the data, but not from the data. I think yeah. that that is something that is very, it's, I love that you focus on Grapes of Wrath as an ethnography, even though it's not like done by an anthropologist, right? And um, Joe Sacco does this a lot, right? In his books, Palestine and Seferi Garajda, he has been, he's a He's a comic journalist and he goes into these spaces and lives with people and interviews them and then tells their stories in a series of uh, stories that give you the feel of living in Gaza, right? right. And um, and uh, it also, that conversation also made me think of, uh, so you Toronto Press has a series called Ethnographic, which I just linked to in the chat. And mm. um, they publish graphic novels specifically by scholars and put them through peer review oh, wow. um, and mm -hmm. then publish it, right? And so it's a university peer-reviewed press book. So you get to count it on your tenure, uh, tenure track, uh, road to tenure or promotion, but it's in the comic form. And so it uses this idea of ethnography that you need to not only have evidence and data and be rigorously researched, but also tell the human story behind it. Right. One of the things I think it's a beer is understanding mm -hmm. that we can't have on a college professor on the podcast without getting a reading list. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Just giving you like four books Yeah, no, this is all, I, I'm experiencing what my students get now. They're like, oh my God. So this is all great. It's like, Emily's like, and here's another thing you need to read. I'm like, okay, it's almost <laughs> summer. I don't know when your semester's over, but you know. Oh, it ended next week. We are, we are. So you have summers off, I know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> right? As we all do. Uh, no, what? they're free. They're totally free. Uh, one. Th well, first, let me say I'm going to change all of my resume and social media bios to say this thing you wrote reminded me of the made me think of the grapes of wrath. That's that's going to mm -hmm. be my new. I'm I'm hanging my hat on that uh, <laughs> from now to the moment I die. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. But the but what you said about not wanting to take the data the data and like just inject it into the um into the comic is is good and right and a lot of, and i like when per, uh, professors and researchers are aware of that like i turned in a two-page comic and one it helps me i can move away from that um with the more material that i'm given to work with uh from a researcher or a scholar uh, i've noticed that because i was uh i turned in a two-page script yesterday and uh, the material I was given was very sparse. So I did infuse a lot of the data that they had because I didn't really have a ton to work with. And uh, and then we give uh, scholars the chance to have some rounds of edits to the to the to the script. And so immediately, like by when this one's we're trying to get this done in a. In a this is kind of we're moving fast on this project. So I turned it in yesterday morning and by uh, the afternoon. The scholar came back and was like, hey, we don't need in they they gave me a lot of great edits, but they're like, we don't need any of this data. We want it to just kind of resonate um, with like the heart of what we're doing. And I was like, oh, great. That's that's all I need to know. And so it actually shortened the script up a lot, but got it right where they wanted it. And and I like that collaboration aspect, too, um, that we do of, of getting to go back and forth with the people whose you know, work we're trying to represent well. And, and it, it's just great when they get into it. Um, you know, I'll, Daniel DeCaro out of Louisville, he is fantastic. He just, we, we're finishing up a third abstract for him and, uh, and every time he's just really into it, into the process, you know, he's like, Hey, can this panel look like this? Can it do this? Can we do this? And I just, when you see scholars get real excited as the work is going on, um, that's a big win for me. It's just, it, it just makes the whole process that much better. Mm. No, I love to hear that too, because it's like 
even thinking about the, the typical peer reviewed process too, it's, it's, you know, often double blind or anonymous, right? You don't even know who's, who's reviewing your paper and you get sure. comments back, but this is like, you know, the, the other side, or it's, I mean, I'm going to put in air quotes, the industry side of things where it's like, you are always working on a team with people often and you have to go back and forth. Um, and so that's like an interesting and refreshing piece. I work in industry also. So this is like, it's, it's nice to see echoes um, on that <laughs> side, um, you know, of that we can also think about like rigorous research work the same kind of way, you know, um, and something else like that, that you said, Emily, that, that is sparking some, some thoughts here is that when we're thinking about creating, um, you know, visual representations of, of, you know, peer reviewed work and you Toronto, like ethnographic series is a great example. And I just now saw that at least Waterston, who is the former president of the American Athletic Association has a, has a book on there. So I'm going to check it out on, awesome. on the search for yeah. meaning, um, mm, cool. you know, but you know, but, uh, cause one of, one of the pieces that you, you said was, was that like, we not only need to have the data and have it be rigorously researched, right. But then also have that human side of the story. And so even Travis, what you were just sharing there echoed that idea where it's like, I've got here, yo, here's all the data. And they're like, yo, yo, we just want, we want, give me the meat, give me the story, give me the thing that's going to get people hooked in. Um, and so interesting to think about how we balance those two elements of like, how do you bring the connecting through line of, of the human story um, that doesn't get awashed in the data, but then also then for the other side, for the other audience that wants that data, they don't, they don't um, feel like it's, it's missing, I guess, you know? So that, I, I wonder, I mean, is, is this one of the fulcrums, the idea of like keeping the human story and the data together? Is this one of the things that like graphic writing helps us think about um, or think about in a different way that like can get lost in text based work only? I'm thinking out loud here. Yeah. I don't know if that, if that sparks any thoughts. Yeah, yeah so I think that's it, fair. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say part of it, and, and and this is something I, you get to present some idea of conflict. If you're going to tell a story, you have to present some idea of conflict, and that is not in the data, and that is not that's not the that's not what it is. I mean, the data can show where a problem is, but then there has to be a point of tension. And so the story can can give you that point of tension and and can strip the data from it. Um, and then you kind of get it like, oh, this is the problem that needs to be overcome. Mm. And there is a maybe a way to overcome it or, or, you know, there's something on the other side that, that has been developed. Um, there's some philosophy, some, some idea, some technology that is helping us with this point of conflict. And I think that adds this layer of, of importance to the work. Um, and that's usually when I go into a script, that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Mm. I think mm. Emily I, made um, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I also wanted to note that sometimes we're trying to do that, right? We're trying to take someone's research, just data heavy, jargon heavy, and we're trying to connect it to people's lived experiences. And that's what we're largely doing when we're doing academic work or work for academics. But we also do work for nonprofits where we're trying to take people's lived experience and connect it to the research, right? That we're trying to like create credibility for a nonprofit and demonstrate to the people they're trying to work with why political science research or why sociology has insights that will help them to do the things that they want to do in their lives. And so I think that there are various projects where you need to bring in more data and you need to bring in more research in order to be convincing for one goal or another. I was, I was going to follow up with something you said that I think is crucially important because I'm in the midst of this at my school, this idea of tenure review, right? And this idea of, for a lot of schools, this focus on impact, impact measures. Mm -hmm. And as I like to tell people, citation indices aren't measures of impact, they're measures of citations. Right. Whether or not that's <laughs> impact, who knows? And if we want right. to talk about what impact can be, what it constitutes, or what constitutes it, we have to look at a variety of different potential measures that could be reflective of impact. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the chat. I always I always laugh about sociology's self-imposed irrelevance in that we complain that no one will listen to us, but then we write in ways that no one can understand us. No one can read. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, I, why won't anybody listen to us? I'm like, oh, gee, I don't know. It's because I don't know what the hell you're saying, and I do this for a living. Mm -hmm. You know, and then but then mm -hmm. you want to complain that we don't have relevance, even though we are a very relevant discipline. And so you know, we we can't have it both ways, right? We can't say. On the one hand, we're only going to account for impact, those things that are academic oriented and not public oriented. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, wonder why no one will listen to us and why we don't have water impact outside of academia. Mm. And the metrics is where it starts. That, yeah, no, I would totally agree with that. And I think that there are um, 
some schools and some disciplines that do better than this than others, right? So anthropology, the um, the American Association for Anthropology or whatever the 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 the, the ASA of anthropology, which I think is mm-hmm. AAA, and AAA, yeah. Um, yeah, and they um, as an organization emphasize and are pushing departments to include things like impact in their measurements of people's successes in their research program. And there are other departments that do this more explicitly. So public policy schools, international affairs schools, public health schools, part of what they see as the metrics of success include um, public impact. But I also think that, so I think that that's something that we can take into account that people could do better on. But on the other hand, it also can filter into your research success in different ways, right? So the NSF, Mm -hmm. for instance, requires um, broader impacts for any any project that they fund. So you have to not only say that this is important for intellectual knowledge, but also this is how you're going to disseminate this and make it impact the real world. And people can use comics for that. And when you do, when you get NSF grants and can do this broader impact, that helps your tenure case, right? And that helps your promotion case, and that helps you publish. And so, um, impact is not only directly important, and we could measure it more directly, but it also filters into, you know, the things that that get you tenure in any place. Hmm. It it is it is a plus to see that we are seeing those kind of shifting goalposts, as it were. Uh, but I think that that's a that's a well said point too, where, um, you know, one metric is like a direct metric of impact that you have to either talk about or it doesn't matter for tenure. But then also then the flip side, if you're doing grant work or something else that um, ultimately finds its way into increasing your um, standing, you know, either in the academy and or in, in the public that can also kind of work mm-hmm. the other way to help, help as well. So I think that is interesting. And, and like, perhaps that's also where it's, it's like, if there's more traditional, uh, I don't know, tenure, tr- uh, uh, committees that wouldn't think about graphic writing or, or comics or, or graphic novels as, as forms of scholarship, um, and that form, but then if it, they kind of enter the side door, right, through through a, yeah. a grant or something else, could be could be an interesting other piece. But I agree to you like, with your frustration, Gary, that it's like that there's not more straightforward pathways of like or doing audio work too, right? Or doing other kind of non traditional right. forms of of scholarship and scholarly thinking. Um, but the good thing is, I, mean, even, also, so I didn't know about the U of Toronto piece. So the the the, the sorry, the ethnographic publishing yeah. group, and so like that's a great example there of like that it's there's a huge backing from a publisher too. But sorry, go ahead, Emily. And MIT Press does the same, right? They will do a peer-reviewed mm. graphic novel for you. Like they won't pay for you to pay the artist, but they will publish it and they'll put it under mm. peer review. And um, we also, so you mentioned the illusion of accountability. I mentioned the segregation by design. Um, mm. The books, if you put a comic in the front of your book, it's not going to go, like it's not going to be considered by the peer reviewers in the book publishing process. But I tell you that the, um, award committees are going to notice that you put something in there for public impact, mm. right? And so, like, you you do look better when you have awards on your CV, too. <laughs> Wait a second. You got to pay the artists? I thought they just did it for exposure. I mean, you actually have to pay them? Oh, yeah, yeah. Art's, to- art's totally free. They it's just, just free. They're just doing work. it for the love of it. I mean, it does raise yeah. the- Art for art's sake, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do wonder, you know, and I know that you have an in-house design uh, agency, Emily. Um, with your husband, <laughs> uh, which is useful, but I, you know, I do wonder about the process and and the cost. Do, if, do you find people are worried about costs? And you know, like, you don't give me a quote here, but just are people worried about the cost of it? And how do you talk about cost and return? To speak like a business person, return on investment. That yes, mm-hmm. it might cost more, but it's going to have this better outcome of learning. It's going to have this better outcome of engagement. It's going to have this better outcome of impressions or things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So we do talk about, I mean, we have language that we can send to people who want to put it in their grant proposals about why comics have impact and what kind of impact that they have. There's a lot of research in, for instance, the public health um, uh, discipline that implies uptake, right? That explains why people respond to comics with um, call, uh, by acting and changing their behavior, especially, you know, like smoking ads, uh, ads against smoking, rather, against sugar and things like that, they can include comics and they have a lot of impact. And so we get to, we we bring that data to the table, but we also 
um, uh, are more affordable than you would think in particular because we do everything in house, right? So we have a script writer, we have script writers, we have line artists, we have colorists, we have designers, and they work together and we manage that team, which is way easier than you as an independent researcher trying to find a script writer and trying to find an artist and trying to like going make on, sure that they're going on Fiverr. creating your files <laughs> the right way and all that kind of thing, yep. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there, I mean, in the, yeah, there's a huge benefit to that. I've got um, a friend now, the artist of Techno Nights. He's working with one of my favorite um, religious historians because um, they're friends. And he is um, doing the art for a comic that um, uh, Matthew Kressler is the, is the historian is doing. And But they're having to piece it together slowly, take their time, trying to find, you know, more funds it's just it's moving a lot slower i'm i'm super excited for them uh to be doing that but there is like a thing to hey we we can do um all of this right here in one go and and get it done and so this is not a knock to what marcus and matthew are doing because i i think that they're both great and i've i you know i'm close with with marcus for sure so i'm glad that he's getting to do that but i just thinking about the difference in you know going at it without a team like what we provide and how we can get it done and, you know, um, and on a production level in, in, also, in addition to a talent level. Um, so. I will also say that there is definitely an inequality, right? There are some organizations that can afford to do this and others that cannot, right? Or there are institutions where people have really good uh, flush research accounts and other places that absolutely don't. And so we, we also want to, we want to help them with their grant process, for instance. We do a lot of proposals that people can put into their grants. But we also um, want to be able to run our business in a way that um, we can uh, adjust pricing for different people's abilities to pay and to be able to, because um, all science is worth well, I guess not all science, but most science is worth sharing with the public. And, uh, and so you shouldn't be hindered by your ability to pay to be able to get your messaging out. Do you find that I took a one day visual storytelling workshop years ago? Right. Yeah. And it was really helpful in reimagining what I do in the classroom. And so I wonder after working with y'all, do folks, does, does, is there an impact on how they even approach how they teach into a more storyboarded narrative style versus you know, what I call, you know, the arsenal approach, which is more bullets than the National Guard has, you know, just like bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, text heavy, you know, just a recitation of um, material versus a narrative flow to make it more memorable and engaging. I hope so. I don't know. I really hope that it does because we, I mean, in when Travis or Tom are writing scripts, they're asking people to think about their research as a story as storytelling. Right. Um, and I hope that impacts them in their teaching. I don't know that it does, um, but it's a good question. We should ask people. I, for, I mean, I've been teaching now for 13 years and uh, I definitely only started using comics myself in the last five years, but it has totally transformed my classroom, right? right? I every almost every week I'm assigning both a peer reviewed art journal article with statistics or game theory models, but assigning it alongside a chapter of a graphic novel where someone is experiencing the rights violations that this other article is talking about. And so my students are are pairing the experience and the data together and and how we talk about them in the classroom. And so um, it has certainly changed my teaching behavior, but I hope that it takes it has changed others as well hmm. i mean it makes me, me think in terms of um this the idea of when we're teaching in terms of our, our goals and approach is it like are we are we delivering facts or are we delivering stories uh, and obviously mm -hmm. facts can come through stories and stories can can have facts you know but oftentimes mm -hmm. like to gary's bullet point point um it's like here's <laughs> the 10 things you need to know uh or a journal article is the same kind of thing right it, it's like a it's a convoluted 10 points that you need to know. Um, whereas a story is the experience of someone. And like, obviously oftentimes, especially in social science, 
journal articles and literature that there will be people's stories as part of them, right? But they like serve the theoretical purpose to illustrate right. some some larger issue. And like that's, I mean, all stories can do that also. So it's this interesting question of like how we how we do that. So it's cool to hear how in, in the classroom setting you can pair a graphic novel experience of someone that that's having a, a experience of discrimination, right? And then like then put that with a a article, a journal article mm-hmm. that is um, talking about like the larger social issues around that are the kind of the, the political theory. Um, yeah. I think is is an important, interesting way to approach that. That um, also just speaks to the need to incorporate multiple multimedia, right? And that sounds like such an old term now, doesn't it? Multimedia, right? Remember, we're going to use Encarta in 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 uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. You send you know. out these comics on a you know CD ROM. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With your AOL CD, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Travis, how'd you get hooked, how'd you get hooked up with all yeah. these people? Good. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you're out there the, in Texas. I mean, you know, yeah. so like, what was that process? Like and you're in history, not political science. Was there like something on Craigslist or like what was going on? No, it was an indeed. It was indeed. So I have a really good uh, friend and artist and fellow comic book creator named uh, Ben Humanic. And uh, we actually have a, a, a graphic novella coming out uh, next spring, but um, that we're working on now, but he uh, back in, Gosh, July 2021. Um, we're in this kind of group chat DM on Twitter with a lot of fellow comic book creators. Um, and he said, Hey, here's this job opportunity. And, you know, he was like, Travis, it might be great for you because I know that you're doing your PhD and they do academic comics and they need a script writer. And so I was just like, All right, <laughs> yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and so I threw my hat in the ring um and and tossed in my portfolio and had an interview with emily and derek and then a couple of weeks later i had a job so mm-hmm. it was it was pretty great um the comic book community is pretty fantastic about you know kind of watching out for each other and trying to find jobs that people would benefit from and, and that that fit for each other and so it's and especially these types of of the kind of group texts where it's like, Hey, anybody see this opportunity or, Hey, this opportunity would be good for so-and-so in the group. And, and so I'm just real thankful of, of friends like that who pointed that out because now I get to do, I get to wake up and do comics every day and couldn't be happier. I'm just sort of imagine this interview with a bunch of people geeking out about comic books. I mean, right. <laughs> Right. It's been like five hours long as you're kind of digging into, and then I can imagine like comic book people talking about like one up in each other in terms of their deep comic book knowledge. It's like listening to sports <laughs> fans talk to each other, just keep going further and further back into the statistical almanac. It must have been, uh, did you record it? Because I would like to watch that. <laughs> I don't think we did. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, it is pretty fun. But it's also like we're a very different comic company than most people have experienced yes. before, right? And so um, they they might think they're coming in to geek out, but we're also, you know, asking them about their educational background, at, at, like what kinds of science are they interested in, or can they do, you know, technical illustrations and those kinds of things. Well, it does raise a question: like, would you consider yourselves to be a comic book company or something else? Um. That is a good question. I call it a comic studio when I describe it to people. Um, but we're it's it's more like we're a communications company and we use mm. visual communications as our medium. Um, but with a very specific focus focus on sequential art, which not everything needs sequential art, right? Every some ideas are things that you can't quite get at that way. So mm. no, that's, I tell that's a good point, actually. That, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I tell people I work for a comic book company based out of Nashville. So I'm not, as, I'm not near as eloquent as that. Well, we, we were just at Adam and I and another person were just at South by Southwest. And, you know, I met Emily at the American Sociological Association where I don't know what your traffic was like in the exhibit hall, but at South by Southwest, when you're describing what you're describing to me, it just kind of screams South by Southwest as a yeah. potential audience it's in the south by southwest has an edu version they, so like their first mm-hmm. session is south by southwest edu so i do not know that i mean you talk about comic book and the comic book crowd yeah. <laughs> and you know design group and all this other stuff it does feel like it has a lot of potential and actually going into you know sequential potential but also going into 
using uh, Adam's antiquated term, you know, because he's a boomer of multimedia, the ways in which we can <laughs> link up if you're doing a historical novel on some period, you know, you can link in YouTube videos or other materials that mm -hmm. work into this, or is it, or do we want people to be more immersed into the graphic representation itself and not be sidetracked by these other kinds, kinds of distractions? Cause some, you know, more distractions are not always better. I think both are really advantageous. Right. And I think that it depends on what you're trying to do, right. If you're trying to change, change someone's perspective, like we're doing with the Iran project that Travis described, then I think you want a more immersive experience. But if what you're trying to do is, for instance, convince people to get their COVID vaccines, then you might want links embedded in a comic where they can go to information about vaccine uptake and you can go to information about how it's administered or here's where you could find your local clinic or, here, you know, so like, I think that there are different types of messaging that would benefit from each of those. Um, but we almost always will try to embed a QR code to somebody's published research in, in the comic, at least. Hmm. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's interestingly, cool we haven't, um, Travis has taken our stuff, our materials to comic cons several times, and we don't get a whole lot of uptake at comic cons. We just get people who want to work for us. Um, <laughs> But instead, mm. like we do our sale, we get more sales by like going to the exhibit halls at ASA, AAA, um, and uh, uh, the American Political Science Association. Yeah, and I mean that's just because the nature of Comic Con is is a is consumer based. Like, oh, what is a comic I can buy? And we right. have little like one page, you know, abstracts, and we don't have full form um, comics yet. We're working on you know, three right now, but, uh, there's that aspect, but also it's like, Oh, you work for this company. Where can I go buy their stuff? What comic book shop are they in? And it's like, right. oh, and it's not, not us. it's not really what we do. <laughs> the library. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. University of Toronto that. press. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Adam, were you going to say something? Um, I was just going to, to note that um, it's interesting in that regard, too, because on the opposite side of the fence, the reason that I like to go to South by Southwest is because as a, as a business anthropologist and as, as a podcaster and media producer, I get way more traction there. Like I go to academic conferences and people are asleep. Like and I'm like, oh, I'm doing yeah. a podcasting session and everyone's like, don't care. Um, so this is interesting. So <laughs> yeah. it is. I mean, it is about knowing your audience, right? And, and like, mm -hmm. how do you translate? Because it's like for me, it's the trick. Of how do I go backwards? Um, or go yeah. back into anthropology to say, this is interesting. Here's why, um, right. you know, where it's easy at a podcast conference, for example. Um, so yeah. I feel your pain <laughs> trying to figure out like, what's the right place to plug in, you know? Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting to realize that like, graphically, like or graphic writing and, and sequential comics, like play differently at an academic exhibition hall versus a Comic-Con. Um, that, yeah. That's an interesting insight too, um, <laughs> for us all to think about that. Everything doesn't go, everything doesn't go everywhere. And despite yeah. the, the title of the film, everything ever all at once, right? It's like there are there are right. niches for a reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it does sure. it does feel like we're on like maybe a verge, <clears throat> pardon me, of more of this public impact. And you know, I was talking with Travis earlier about you know, I live stream on Twitch and I do I'll do my lecture notes live on Twitch to an mm -hmm. audience of whomever. Um, are doing the podcast or some people on TikTok or Instagram. Uh, our school is looking at hiring a content creator to help faculty. Uh -huh brand out their research and this idea of engaging people where they are versus expecting them to come to us because mm -hmm. if for no other reason, then if we're not out there filling that void, someone else will be with more nefarious goals in mind. And that okay. in, in an era, in an era of, you know, multimedia communication and social media impact, if we're not doing that thing, then we can't expect people to know any longer come to us because knowledge is being created or misknowledge is being created everywhere. And so mm. we need to create mm. knowledge everywhere as well. Mm. That's yeah. good. I totally mm. agree. And so you are leading the way in doing that. Do you find different uptake in different conferences based on different professional domains like AAA versus ASA versus the American political science, whatever your organization is versus a mm -hmm. history conference? Do you find different cultures of professions 
reacting differently to the idea? Absolutely. Um, we actually didn't get a lot of uptake at, at ASA. I didn't um, see like it. That, when I walked by, I was like, and that maybe because us? I had like the worst location in the hall. But there's, there's no <laughs> good location in that hall. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I kind of thought that it would play better because of the emphasis in sociology on storytelling. And I just, it just didn't really get a whole lot of uptake. We've had a lot of success in political science. Um, but I think also political science is getting a lot of pressure to demonstrate its relevance um, in our political world. Um, there are, you know, um, there's been attacks on the NSF funding political science programs or political science research because Congress doesn't like to fund research on itself um, and those kinds of things. And so I think that there's been a lot of shift in our discipline to emphasize um, the relevance outside of the academy of this research. And I think that the sciences have a similar type of pressure, especially, again, because they're so government funded or publicly funded and things like that. And so um, where I thought that we would get the best uptake in the places that are doing storytelling, we're actually like finding more uptake from disciplines that need to do storytelling but aren't already doing it. <laughs> right. And, and we and as so speaking as a sociologist, it's not surprising, but it is infuriating that we spend a lot of time collecting people's stories, but don't aren't necessarily good at doing much with them or could be do at least could be yeah. doing a better job with them. So it's not surprising that there wasn't more uptake. Or sharing the research with the people you interviewed. Like it's just not happening that much, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's why you're doing, you know, amazing work and 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 trying to get us to think about ways in which we should be doing this more for sure. So, like, what's the like? What are the next frontiers with like technology? Is it just going to be like AI generated comic books or things like that? Or <clears throat> those are here and they yeah. are being taken to task by those that create comics um, on a regular basis. So. Interesting. Not just for um, for quality that AI generates right now in terms of I mean the biggest joke is they can't AI can't do hands um, right and can't do <laughs> hands are hard and, yeah, hands are hard, they are. Hands are hard. <laughs> and, uh, and they can't they can't generate like good facial expressions um, so those are some problems just in the critique of what is being created the second thing is what uh, copyright issues happen because, you know, right now, like mid journey and other AIs, they pull from what's accessible to them on the internet and what's accessible to them is other people's artwork, uh, that has been posted. So the question is, you know, at what levels is plagiarism? And then the last thing is, is just the idea of, you know, we, we have artists that, that have trained and they are talented and, right. and why, and, and there's and so my part of this argument is there's a, the human element of an art of an artist being able you can see that in a piece. I've seen AI generated art that is that is good for a comic and that is really bad. And even the best stuff, I'm like, there's no human element. There's there's a if you've seen enough comic art, um, you can tell when there's no heart in it from from an AI generated image versus what you can see. And maybe, maybe that'll change. I don't know, but I just don't think so. It, I just don't think so. And so that's the question. And, and for me personally, there are people that are doing that, but part of comics for me that I love, and this is probably because I can't draw it all, but um, just the, the collaborative teamwork of it. And, and it, I mean, some of it comes from a sports background and playing basketball and um, it, it, it just, that aspect of how do we figure this out? How are we going to create this page or the story together? Um, and, you know, we've got me, a line artist, colorist, letterer, and and we're going to, and an, and an editor, and the five of us are going to come together and make something, make something really special. And I, I just love that. I, I mean, yesterday I talked to seven different artists because I've got seven different projects going on and I, texted all of them at least once about something, some stage of the process. And I love that. Maybe it's just because I need friends. I don't know. Um, we all need friends. Yeah. Travis, we all need friends. Speaking as a sociologist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Professional uh, judgment mm -hmm. there. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, cool. I just want to, I mean, for me, I actually have, I have to jump off here in a minute to another meeting. Um, so we can, if you want to keep talking, keep talking, please. But um, I want to say thank you all so much. This has been super, super enlightening and fun to, to wax, wax comically and poetic with you in, in the <laughs> research and, and graphic arts and, and all the good stuff. So um, really, really appreciate the work pleasure. that y'all are doing and um, hope to keep it up. Yeah. Absolutely. Adam, it was great Adam. meeting you. Thank you so much. We want to thank Emily Ritter and Travis Hill of Sequential Potential once again for coming on and talking about their work of bringing academics to life through comics. You can find out more about their work in our show notes. And as always, we want to hear from you. What is your favorite comic if you have one? And if you have one, do you prefer fiction comics? Do you have any nonfiction comics that that stand out to you, something that you, you, you enjoy reading? What academic topic would you like to most see made into a comic? I love this question and I'm really excited to see what the community thinks. Um, you know, are we, do we want to see something like, you know, the Protestant ep- ethic in the spirit of capitalism made into a comic book? Or do you want to see like, I don't know, Richard Saylor and Nudge made into a comic book? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the, 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 the aperture wide there. Now, what do you want to see as a, as a topic that's brought into a comic? Um, and also, is there a famous scholar or thinker that you would like to see appear in a Marvel movie? So we're changing it up here, right? And what would the superpower be? You know, would, would Foucault be like the, the French sexualized Professor X? I don't know. Um, hmm. Could be, you know. So anyway, shoot us a message over at feedback at experiencexdesign.com or get in the conversation on our LinkedIn page. I think uh, Max Weber would be more Magneto since he is German. And I think <laughs> that C. Wright Mills would be Captain America. Ooh, you that's know, a good, yeah. That's yeah, like whose superpower is smashing the power elite. That, that's, that's where I would go with that. Using his sociological imagination to peer through structure to find truth. But that's just me. So I'm gonna maybe, maybe we can pitch that. And so with that brilliant idea, we want to thank you so much for listening to Experience by Design and happy to say we've cracked the 12,000 download mark, which is a nice number to hit. And we couldn't have done it, obviously, without you because I can't download that much. And we would really do like bringing this content to you. Love talking to our guests like Sequential Potential and very excited to create content that hopefully connects with our audiences. And as always, if you're looking for uh, a way to increase increase your profile, to connect your content to a wider audience, please reach out to us at experiencexdesign.com so we can talk about an episode, talk about sponsoring an episode, or just talk. Sometimes just talking is good. I'm always just happy to talk. Mm -hmm. You can always support our efforts at Buy Us a Coffee over at our website, experiencexdesign.com, where we have the Buy Us a Coffee link. So you can help us bring this content to you. And any feedback you have, make sure to send it to feedback at experiencexdesign.com. Love hearing from you. You can join us over on LinkedIn as well or any place else where you can find us. And we're around. So with that, I hope you're all well, be kind, be good, be safe, stay inspired to bring content to your audiences in new and creative ways. And we will see you here next time on Experience by Design.